want to say welcome. Uh, Jean is joining me today. And Jean, I forgot to clarify how to pronounce your last name. I want to say Kaluza, but I don't want to sound foolish. So you nailed it. That was great. Oh, it's it's wow. an old car horn sound. Kaluza. Oh, <laughs> Kaluza. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> Perfect. <laughs> nailed oh. it. Uh, Jean is uh, tuning in all the way from, wait, are you in Argentina or are you in Ohio? I was kind of confused, so. I'm in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Wow. But she originated in Ohio, and I'll have her share her story mm -hmm. here in a second. Um, but we wanted to live talk together because um, we both have dystonia, and Jean has focal dystonia and generalized dystonia, um, which she's going to share about today. Uh, and I've been wanting to talk to Jean for a really long time because I've actually uh, saw your interview with, on a newscast a long time ago, was several years ago. I think probably not too long after you got it. And um, and then she just happened to reach out to me like recently and then we connected and we've been chatting here and there. And so we set up a live talk and here we are. Um, so Jean, um, if you could just share a little bit with us about your background, maybe like you said in your description, like where you grew up and how did you get into percussion in particular? Um, how did I get into percussion? I wanted to be my brother. I wanted to be just like him. He was the coolest and he played drums. So it seemed like a one for one. Also, I wasn't, I felt like the Charlie Brown of the female variety like I just <laughs> was comically bad at what seemed like everything and I was just like well maybe you know he's pretty good at it maybe I could be somewhat decent and uh you know he I still remember the first time uh my mom was smart enough to know that my brother couldn't teach me and we we both got uh, music teachers but I came home from my first music lesson and I was already like bummed. I was like, I'm not immediately good at this. Like this life is terrible. I was uh, 12 when I started. So I was uh, immediately impatient as a lot of kids would be. And he just sat down with me and we worked it out. You know, like he was, he just like broke it down for me. And, and uh, it was a great way to uh, bond with him. And uh, yeah, the rest is history. As soon as I got past that first, I guess, hump and like he kind of showed me like, this is how you practice. And then like, there's going to be blocks and like, this is how you get over them. I was like, gauntlets off. I get it. I'm ready. <laughs> That's awesome. And I, and I think you excel pretty fast. Um, well, like I said, at first you were kind of frustrated, but you but you must have yourself pretty fast because um by nineteen you had already kind of landed landed gigs, and I think you were in in drum corps. Am I correct? It was heavily, heavily, heavily involved drum corps. I love drum corps. Uh, still do. Uh, it's definitely taken some interesting recent modern turns I feel like an old lady when I watch it now I'm just like I don't I don't get what these kids are doing <laughs> um but it's just such a cool uh thing to to show to people it's very hard to explain to people if you're not involved in it but uh I had always wanted to do it of course as soon as my brother did it I was like my turn <laughs> to do it too the goal was always to be in like the same snare line as him. Uh, unfortunately, snare is just the hardest thing ever to make. Um, so I I didn't just love drums. I love drums, but like I was very motivated on top of that to like try to. Uh, he was three years. He's three years my senior, so um, you know he was three years ahead of me because he had started three years before, and so if I was going to be in the same line as him, I was constantly against everybody his age, everybody my age, everybody younger. So like, I just had this fire in me to like, if I'm going to be in the same line as him, I'm going to have to like get my act together and get as good as he is at least uh, so that I could, you know, compete, but it was very competitive and yeah, it would take you from beginner to professional, I guess a fast track. <laughs> because you can't you can't hide in a drum corps you are gonna you're gonna stand out yeah and drum corps is pretty is hardcore because I think um and I have a couple of friends that were really involved in it and loved it especially on percussion because it's like you're doing a lot of like the rudimentary like really repetitive like uh uh rhythms yeah. and like making sure that you're like nailing them and really on top of them and um it's very fast paced very you know I don't know. I'm a horn player, so I'm not used to like that kind of <laughs> rhythmic playing. Um, but it seems like it's intense, but also a lot of fun at the same time. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I liked it because it was just so methodical. There was like a very clear, uh, I miss it still because now I'm doing stuff that doesn't follow any of that. But now, uh, like back then, it was just, here's the rudiment. This is how you play it well. You play it that well, really slow and clean. And then you just use a metronome to get it faster and faster. I mean, it was just so, such a clear uh, not easy, I would say, but very clear path on how to get there um, that I think in a lot of more subjective art forms doesn't exist as clearly. Um, I mean, it does to an extent, but I just, you get lost in it because it gets so, I'm going to drop this word, uh, addicting because <laughs> you're just, you know, you can go from zero to a hundred literally on a metronome and like an afternoon. And that was really fun to keep repeating over over and over <laughs> yeah and and i i love that no you i could tell you were very passionate about it even like when i watch your past interviews online and stuff um and and like all of us as, as hard as musicians you know because we like you said we kind of get addicted to it we really get roped into what we're doing and of course that's why we fall in love with it um but then it's it's really hard when something like focal dystonia comes along and 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 sets in um, and usually affects uh, either our predominant hand or 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 other parts of our body that are unexpected. Um, did you you were pretty young though when you got focal dystonia? I want to say you're like probably the youngest person I heard I've heard of having it so far. Um, what age did you first kind of start seeing onset of symptoms? Um, I was already at Disney. Um, I had been there for at least this summer. And then maybe I, how did that happen? I was at Disney. I know this. I have a terrible memory. Uh, <laughs> so I'm just going to, there's probably going to be people who uh, might know it better than I do because that's what's happened in other interviews is <laughs> I've been corrected on my own life. Um, uh, so yeah, just call me uh, Dory and we'll continue. It's uh, <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I definitely was already at Disney, but then um, I marched a season at Drum Corps, or at least I tried. I was in Magic Orlando, and I didn't know I had it, and I was trying to march in it, and it's crazy to me because I, I had made, you know, Blue Coat Snare Line, like, a few years prior to that, a year prior to that, or something like that, and then I couldn't even make... Uh, you know, I tried it for Boston, couldn't make them. And it was just like, this doesn't make sense. Like I, I could do it before. And now I was, I was struggling with like warming up and doing basic stuff and really not sure how to talk about it. I mean, when you're a teenager, nobody, now the teenagers have like lots of better skills, I would say emotionally, but back then, like it was just shut up and get better. <laughs> like get in line there was no oh what's wrong honey it was just like you suck You're like go go practice and make it right um little did I know I was just making it worse uh so whenever I wasn't in like a practice session or rehearsal which was you know all day every day so on the bus basically when everyone was sleeping I was still like trying to work it out uh, of course when I got back to uh, my job at Disney from there um you know, I, I was a wreck. I couldn't do anything. I had to, I felt like I had to come clean to somebody, but I, you know, kept it to myself because it's so embarrassing to, you know, make all these people think and believe that you're good and now you're falling apart. And, you know, I mean, nobody was talking about it. That's why I wanted to become such an advocate because I was, I was like, if somebody had told me, because all I knew was to look out for carpal tunnel, um, tendonitis, uh, tinnitus, like all the things that drummers are exposed to and could get. Like I took pride in not getting, especially when I started going to actual doctors and them like accusing me of getting focal, uh, uh, you know, the other ones like uh, carpal tunnel. I was like, how dare you? Like I warm up correctly every day, sir. Like <laughs> I was so offended. Um, and yeah, if somebody... If that could have been anywhere on my radar, I could have been, uh, you know, saved a ton of excruciating torture of not knowing what it was and blaming myself, you know. So I just didn't want somebody else to go through that. So I was like, I'll post some videos, good excuse to drum. It's not like I can get gigs anymore <laughs> playing like this. So 
seemed like the one way around it, you know? Yeah, I completely relate. I, and I'm so sorry that you had to go through that because it's like really frustrating when you're not quite sure what it is. But like, like you said, it, it's interesting because people will accuse you of like, of ruining your, yourself in like a physical way. And you're like, I haven't damaged myself. Like, I swear to right. God, there's nothing I'm I've done. so offended. Like, <laughs> yeah, like I've done everything correct, you know, by the book for the last like right. you know, 12, 20 years. Like, I don't know why now I'm being questioned, but, um, but no, I completely relate. And, and what it says in dystonia is weird. Cause you're like, like you said, it's kind of like this leg, like you're like, it, it, things are a little sloppy, but it's not, it, it feels weird. It's just different. It's like not quite catching on like it should. And, and you know, it, you're like, it just feels like my body isn't responding in the way I want it to. Um, uh, I have someone here online, Sergio Nadine. Hello, Sergio. Welcome. Um, he's asking a couple questions. Um, maybe there's a way we could reward this. He says, could you show me your dystonia? I suffer a lot with this. Um, maybe we can describe like how it affects you. Um, if it's in a predominant hand or, um, does it affect like certain, uh, I, I want to say, I sound so neurological digits, uh, fingers at all that are, that's affecting primarily. Um, uh, mine kind of started I would say more in my arm itself um and I didn't see it at all um I just knew that there was something a little bit funky in my technique and I was not okay with that I was such a technique uh freak about like getting every angle like the worst thing I I could have been told was like you play it like a girl it was like terrible back then so I was always making sure I like looked and had everything like you couldn't you couldn't touch my technique. Like <laughs> I was right there. So when I, when I couldn't like hold the stick the way I used to, I started like fig trying to figure out what that was. And actually um, a gentleman that I was in the beatniks with walked past as I was trying to work on it. And he's like, Oh, your angle, the angle of your arm is a little bit twisted. And, and so, you know, from there, like it was just, and that's what we're doing. That's my whole life is figuring out that angle, getting it corrected um, the way it affected me, uh, Sergio, is that I, I had to think usually before I had it, I could work on my technique and make it second nature. Like I knew it would take like, you know, so long this many sessions before, like I wouldn't have to worry about my technique. Um, but it wasn't happening like that. I would try to fix it. And like, it was like a whack-a-mole experience where I would fix this and then there was something else. And then now my fingers flying off. Now my my shoulders connected to my ear. Like I just I couldn't catch a break. No matter what I fixed, there was something else. Um, and it just progressed like that. And there was a point where, um, and I might even start uh, presenting uh, some of my more generalized uh, dystonia symptoms as we're talking about because that'll sometimes trigger me. Um, but, uh, when I get it now or when I had it in my hand, cause I don't even have sticks anymore, but when I had it in my hand, my, uh, my hand would, it was like, it was overcompensating. It was like a character of what I taught it to do. So my, I would have the, my fingernails like create divots, like in my hand. And it would just like, it was like trying to puncture the skin. Like I couldn't like peel my fingers out of my, my hand. They would leave these deep gashes like in my in my hand so I had to keep my fingernails really short because they would just get like stuck like that and then because it was squeezing the sticks so hard I had like these really gnarly uh uh blisters all up and down this crevice where the stick was because like I was basically cavemanning it because I still had a gig right <laughs> I still had to everything's fine while it's going down on Disney's floats just like it's cool every <laughs> no one will know it is and like trying to play the uh uh the parts on the floats on these on these electric pads and just like mutilating my my arm physically because I just I couldn't get any of the bounce any of the technique I was literally grabbing it like a caveman sometimes because I just didn't have anything left it would hurt so bad and all over my hand but it was um it was it was just a slow disintegration of of technique, but it was also an exaggeration <laughs> at the same time. 
um, I always tell people it's like, it's like somebody, it's like your body's like almost making fun of itself. It's just like, oh, you want to play drums like this? Then <laughs> you start playing um, kind of crazy. I mean, it's not funny while it's happening, uh, Sergio. I'm sorry if I'm making light of it, but um, sometimes it helps me kind of uh, ease through it, if you will. That makes a lot of sense to me too. Like, and and I I I completely understand the comedy in it because after you have it for so long, it's like you just sometimes have to be like, you know, this disorder. It's such a complex yet interesting disorder in the way it reacts to things, uh, specific things. Um. So, uh, Sergio, the the focal dystonia that part focal dystonia means like focused, and it's focused on specific tasks. So a lot of musicians get focal dystonia because it's focused on one single task, which is like either like playing piano repetitively in this position or playing a brass instrument or wind instrument with one setup here. Um, and and over time, it has to do with a neurological brain pathway, uh, either breaking down or something going wrong. They don't really know what causes it, um, but it's definitely not usually because of, uh, you know, something like a normal physical injury where you're like, oh, I got carpal tunnel and I can, you know, easily fix it by getting surgery or doing physical therapy. This is different because it's like such so much more complex. Um, yes, part of it is is um, you know, the physical uh, playing of of your instrument triggers it. Um or re doing repetitive things trigger it too, but there's also a lot more to it as well. There's also um, you know, uh, neurological component as well as like psychological triggers too for some people. Um, it's just very complex. Not a lot of people know what causes it. Um, it it can happen. He's asking like if it happens in more than one limb. Yes, it can happen in only one hand sometimes. Sometimes it, uh, there's different types of dystonia. Focal is like one limb. Uh, Multi-segmental is multiple limbs. Um, and you can even have like specific other dystonias, like uh, I can never say this one, like bless far marrow, <laughs> and that's like in the eyelids, or you can have oral mandibular, which is farther back in the jaw rather than up here at front. Um, and then there's generalized dystonia, which uh, Jean is going to talk about as well, which uh, originally, Jean, you had just, I think, focal dystonia, and then it progressed into generalized dystonia. And generalized dystonia is a lot more hard to deal with because it, it affects the whole body it's it's and it kind of uh, gets in the, in the way of uh, daily tasks more so than than focal dystonia because it isn't triggered just by the act of playing music so I'll, I'll let Jean explain though because I don't have generalized dystonia I have no idea what it's like um, but um, maybe you can share with us Jean a little bit about how how you kind of notice more happening to your body than just the focal dystonia Sure. Yeah. So obviously, um, I was I was told when I was diagnosed, uh, this is progressive. It's going to be on the uh, mine's on the right side of my body, focalized. That's where it started, just in my arm. Obviously, growing out through my fingers and eventually kind of capsizing any sort of you know rudimental future I thought I had. Um, but then uh, my thought, since I still had full clarity and I'm going to be a musician still obviously <laughs> I was 20 I had no concept of like this might be a real thing um so at 20 and I'm already this professional musician with this catastrophic musician's disorder and I'm just like full steam ahead let's do drum set since I can't play rudimental anymore I'll just because that involves your feet never really played drum set before I was in like this band in in high school uh that was nice enough to let me <laughs> <laughs> drum with them but like never really took it as seriously as I would have like a like a snare drum rudimental kind of competition thing um and then as soon as I started playing with my feet it was like this one-to-one -one correlation of like I would be able to play a pattern with my right foot and then immediately it was I could feel the dystonia kind of overriding it again it was just with my right leg um, so where my right hand was, I think had the skills and like dystonia was like kind of eating away at them. My foot didn't have any. And as I was getting more skills, it was just like, no, <laughs> uh, I, so like I had to stop, uh, that because every time I would make progress, it was just this, uh, I think that's when I started realizing like, oh, this is, this is a little bit 
harder than I thought it was going to be. This is this is going to be something real that I might need to put more respect towards and <laughs> uh, take a little bit more seriously. Um, I would say I didn't really uh, consider it generalized by then because uh, I was, again, told that it would be on the right side of my body. So I just kind of backed away, took my right foot off drum set, and I just played with the rest of the three limbs because um, I could play still reverse and I could outrun the dystonia a little bit better with my hand than I could my foot. You can't really turn the mallet around on your foot. You have no control. It's just your foot is your foot technique. So I had to just be like, all right, so that's not going to work. <laughs> Let's just see how good the left foot can be. And so I had like my my left my poor left foot had to figure out three pedals at once uh, at a certain point to see if I could figure that out. I eventually I had a YouTube channel where I was like trying to track it and it it got ridiculous like uh, like you said Katie like it just got to the point where like am I just gonna play with two limbs are people still gonna want to see that is that even inspirational <laughs> at that point um, this is a real thing uh, I don't know how to run it and I was just kind of on my own journey. Um, I had to sell my drum set, get rid of all the sticks. I just had to kind of like figure out what I was going to do for me before I can, uh, you know, give myself to other people to see how I can help them. Just trying to make sure what I was going through, I knew what I was doing with, I guess. And so, um, I eventually, um, <clears throat> even though I wasn't drumming it, it kind of, it would still, it was still kind of presenting. So like I, I was, I was, I would be in the office. I had an office job by then and I would, my hand would start like acting like there was a drumstick and it would just, it would do this shape and it would start curling up and it didn't look very natural or like an office worker should look. So I would just grab a coffee mug and just carry it around. And it just like, looked like Jean really loved her coffee. <laughs> I would just <laughs> carry it around like, good morning to you, sir. <laughs> and that would yeah. be my day. And I if I, I had you a type or... like a, 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 you told me um, a couple of days or last week when we were talking about how one time you, you were clutching something and it got you like, you couldn't undo it. So you like had to call your roommate and say like, Hey, I can't make it, you know? Cause I, I yeah. was trying to, I was, I was meeting up with someone and I drive stick shift and you kind of need your right hand. And I couldn't get the coffee mug out of my hand. <laughs> like, cause my, my, my fingers like to grip things so hard. And like, as soon as I would release one, the other one would grab on and then my thumb would get involved. Like it was just kind of a mess and I couldn't control it. The best thing you could do on, I've seen, I think it's dystonia warrior. I don't know what her handle is exactly, but there's a person on Instagram I follow where she meditates and I'm so inspired by her because I know that that helps. And I didn't know that at the time, this was years and years ago. Um, but yeah, I would suggest that now because you can kind of calm your nervous system enough to like release um, if you get that far. But yeah, generalized dystonia, I just, I kept on having these like symptoms. I would kind of crump walk like because I had this little limp in my right leg and I was like I'm not drumming like where is this coming from it turned out my job at the time was so toxic and and stressful it was probably because of that um but I didn't know that nobody nobody kind of knows it in hindsight is the best uh but and when you're in the storm it's pretty hard to say what's happening but that's definitely what was going on. And the neurologists were beside themselves. I was seeing a physical therapist that was very concerned because my dominant hand would have been my left hand because I actually am left-handed, but all of drumming is more geared towards right-handed dominated drummers, obviously for therapists, that's what everyone is. And um, so she would say, um, you know, I'm really concerned because you're weak, like you're, you're legitimately weaker and in, in the wrong hand and, and we got to go get some tests. And she wouldn't really explain why that she, she looked very flustered. Like she went from like happy go lucky and we're going to work this out to like, we got to get you, you know, very, uh, 
she was very concerned. So we went and got some CT scans and MRIs. I had no idea I, uh, why we were doing it. I just knew that we had to go get some tests. And then um, they were actually, um, <laughs> I don't think neurologists for all they do, they're all their superpowers. I think mine, at least in my experience, could have worked on bedside manner a little bit more. <laughs> they were very much just, uh, uh, yeah, they, they like bedside manner. So I went to their office with all my CT and MRI scans ready to go. And my, my physical therapist wasn't telling me what's going on. They weren't telling me what's going on. And there's two or three of them in the room at the time. And they're just pouring all over these scans. And finally, I just tap one on the shoulder. I'm like, can you explain to me what we're looking for? And he just turned around. He's like, we are looking for tumors <laughs> and turn back around. And I'm like, well, that's my brain. And if we're, if I have a team of neurologists looking through all these scans, like I would have loved to know, because mind you, I'm getting, I'm having all these scary, like brain tumor-ish uh, symptoms. I'm having past dystonia's uh, symptoms. I'm getting all those plus like unsolicited, you know, I'm not even drumming kind of symptoms. Um, I'm getting these crazy migraines never even had a headache before uh just like super scary I, I would have this thing where I would like see a light which I'm told is a different kind of migraine and it's like more serious so I'm just now I'm pouring over my own notes because I'm just like so I do I'm this is it and I was freaking out over that and um fortunately that all turned out just to be uh generalized dystonia they found no tumors there was nothing there um, but yeah, they did come back and say, um, you do have generalized because you're limping and it's not, you know, just limited to your arm anymore. It's spreading. So there you go. And they gave me a bunch of medications I've tried. Uh, I don't remember them all because it was so long ago and I only tried them for like a week or two because they were not helpful for me personally. Um, and I kind of gave up on all that stuff, but, um, yeah. yeah. That's, that seems, that's a really long-winded way of saying it was generalized Estonia. <laughs> no, I, I thank you so much for sharing all that. It's really important to hear it and to your kind of the process we went through. Mm. Not my throat's really dry. Oh, sorry. Um, um, but uh, no, it makes a lot of sense. It's been a lot of fun to get it. I know that. Um, the folks in Estonia are right here working in Europe and Europe. I mean, a lot of them have been able to give it. It has to sort of like work. I want to say that I buy products for them, but the effect of them, uh, uh, the negative effect of them is, is more strong than the actual help that it's giving us. Um, so a lot of us I kind of have to resort to alternative forms of treatment um, or go into alternative forms of, of medicine. Um, and so for a lot of us, it's very experimental to try to find like what works for us. And there's not a lot spoken about up there. And, and the ones that are kind of broadcast is like, we don't have enough research or information on it. Um, but, uh, oh, sorry, I have someone writing here really quick. Um, Sergio, yep, definitely you can, uh, he wants to share a video with you sometime, Jean. Um, I can go ahead and forward that to her. Um, you can just inbox me or you can um, uh, message the Musicians Dystonia page as well, if that's easier and just send the video through that inbox and I'll go ahead and forward it to, to Jean. Um, thank you so much for participating by the way, Sergio. I really enjoy all your questions here. Um, but yeah, a lot of us have to find some other way of coping with dystonia. And um, it, it's hard because like some people get stuck really on like, on like, you know, one form of treatment, which isn't bad. If that works for them, that's great. Like if they're like Botox is the way, that's perfect. Um, that's good. But I do like to hear like what helps other people, even if it's like, um, you know, any any little thing from like, you know, uh, tools to techniques to uh, forms of therapy to other body movement types of um, uh, treatment. And so I was wondering if you had anything that that you've tried uh, along the way that has maybe helped you or some things that definitely didn't help you or, or some advice you could give there as far as your journey with dystonia. Yeah, um, I have a lot of thoughts on this. I think first off, it's a disservice to say, to call 
uh, musicians dystonia just a neurological disease I think it's you know technically that is all it is but I think it does something profound that even when I talk to others with um other neurological disorders uh they don't have the same challenges not to say it's any less it's just different right but it's something that I wish somebody would have told me when I first got diagnosed dystonia does a bunch of things that others don't so for, first off it messes with your reality as musicians we learn especially if you go if you get to the point where you have something like dystonia you have learned that if I practice X, uh, Y uh, hours, I get Z. It's a very mathematical, pretty straightforward uh, theory there. And then dystonia comes in as this wild variable that's just like, we don't know what's going to happen. Z is a huge question mark now. Maybe it'll get better. Mm, I'm going to make it so you might get worse. You might have a brand new technique by the time you're done practicing for eight hours. Um, and then maybe you can hurt yourself more. Like, we don't know. It's a surprise grab bag. And that, as a musician, can rock your core. It just, like, takes your whole reality of what you thought life would be. Because as a musician, at least for me, I would be like, oh, so now I know how to get good at something. And now I know how to succeed in college. Now I know how to uh, get better at cooking. Like it just applies to everything. And that core thing is just like out the window. We don't know what that is. Maybe something else like dystonia will come in. So that's the first thing. That's already profound enough, right? <laughs> but the second thing it does, I think is even worse, which is, Musicians that, again, have practiced that long probably have some sort of sense of like who they are through their instrument, through their music. And dystonia takes that and they're, it begs the question, what are you outside of that? Now, for me personally, I think that's a great question to for anybody to kind of make sure they're clear on. But with uh, dystonia, like you don't have a choice, like that's the question, <laughs> right? And you got to kind of be faced with it every day. Um, and it's too scary. What we all really just want to do as musicians is like, just tell me which angle I, I move my horn in or what's the trick. Just tell me that. And um, I think Katie and I have talked about this before. The, the, the thing that's so hard about musicians dystonia that's so unique to us is that there is no angle, like there's no magic thing I can tell you that like it's going to wash it away. That's not, there's not a pill out there. This is doctor. And there's lots of great research. I'm not dissing it. Like let's, let's definitely keep all that going and keep the hope alive. Um, but that question is still going to be there. And I think it's a worthy one to get answered, even if you don't have dystonia, which is like, make sure you as a person don't actually need music. And then you'll love it that much more anyway, like even if you do get to keep it. Um, but I think what dystonia forces on you is it forces you to admit like nothing is truly yours. Nothing is truly permanent. Like it could all go away. So like enjoy every second and just be grateful for like whatever you got. And it's it's torturous because we don't want that. We spent a hundred thousand hours on this. Like it's mine. Give it back. <laughs> And I feel that I feel you, anybody listening, I'm so sorry you're going through this. I'm sorry if you have been diagnosed. I'm sorry if you haven't. The struggle is so real. It's so painful. I am there for you, but it's just like, it's a different kind of suffering that is so hard to explain to folks. I mean, I bring up the drummer, Def Leppard, uh, for the drummer from Def Leppard who lost his arm in a car crash. Um, I'm not saying what he went through was less than what I went through, but I'm saying it's very different. Um, people, when he walks by in the street, know what he's been through, right? They can see him. He doesn't have an arm. Wow. And they're immediately just like in awe of everything he's been through. Um, he had like a custom drum set made for him just so like he can play easier. Um, I just had to sit in my garage and try and work it out. And like I had a my limbs were still there and I had to tell myself don't use them anymore like it's just 
this it's like a black mirror episode nobody here wants to be in it's it's so psychological and it's like nothing you've ever been through like I I didn't have the brain tumor but it in some ways in my head I was like it sounds easier <laughs> it sounds more straightforward it sounds like way less of an explanation I'd have to give to people it sounds people would know what I mean but if I say musicians Estonia oh my god people are just like that sounds like a made up thing and I'm with them kind of I'm like it does I wish it was but like I literally cannot play and um I think that's the critical part of when people ask about treatments for dystonia. I always want to preface with because to me that is the crux of the beast is the psychological components. Um, and if you can get through that, then the cures, the treatments, and all of that is a very much, uh, uh, much more digestible palette or topic to digest because you can start you know, taking you as a person, as a human out of the equation and look at it much more objectively. Um, I don't think that answered your question at all, but that was my enormous preface to uh, oh, that question. So at least. <laughs> no, I think it's perfect. And it's so beautifully said. And I think it it really gets to the point, you know, of how, how it's very hard for, I mean, it explains one reason why there's not, you know, a lot of practitioners out there that help support musicians with dystonia, because it's, it's not something you can just necessarily go to someone and be like, fix this. And then they're like, oh, I can fix it for you. Here you go. Um, there's always some, you know, like you said, the crux of the issue is like, how well are we able to to handle and digest the fact that this disorder is much more complex than what we give it? We want to think that yeah. it's very simple and, and resolvable through techniques or, or some A, B, C, D <laughs> equals E. Um, but um, uh -huh. It's, it's not that easy. Um, and I think you said it so well and so beautifully. And I'm so glad that you said that. Um, I think that, you know, and I do the kind of same thing too when giving advice. It's like, I just tell people to remain open-minded. You know, we remain very open-minded. Try to get to that mindset yeah. of being experimental and exploring like a child. Um, and I'm kind of sharing a little bit of my story here. And I'm sorry. Um, I I really struggled with accepting my sound of my instrument because on horn, you know, yeah. we're all about the sound. You know, it has to sound beautiful. And and it's one of those instruments where it's like you either sound like you're like a farting machine or you're like an angel that God sent down to from heaven. Yeah, um, it's such a like... beautiful instrument though. Like even <laughs> if it's farting angels, like it's so pretty. <laughs> So was, <laughs> I know right and it was so hard for me except that that sound you know when when I couldn't even yeah. barely get a sound out and when I did it just sounded awful but I, I I learned like kind of that that flip perspective that I needed to get when I became a teacher because the first classes I taught were beginner band um and just to see uh, kids yeah. like so excited to play their instrument even if they were like you know you know putting the mouthpiece in their mouth rather than on their mouth or like you know <laughs> Yeah. holding it the wrong way or just like making the almost absurd noises sure. they were so happy if they could just like be there with people just making noise or you know got one little note out and I was like wow I really it made me it humbled me because I was like oh wow I really need to rethink like why I love music like why do I love music like do I still love Dude, it and without yeah it? Katie that's like the whole thing right like it's kind of I hate I hate when people are like, it's a gift, but like, we're, if we're just so focused on cure me, cure me, cure me, and like, I'm sick of this, like fluffy talk, like, just what do I do? Like, you're missing the lesson, like, you're missing the gem here. Like, it's, it's, it's an opportunity, right? To kind of take a step back and remember those things. I have a similar experience. I had a group lesson with these five fifth graders, and in order to get them to focus long enough on my very boring technique lessons. <laughs> I would bribe them with, You'll, you're allowed to go through the drum closet and we can take out any instrument you want. You can pick one instrument and I'll take it out and I'll teach you how to play it. We'll play around with it at the end of the class. Like just listen to me for five more minutes. And these five fifth graders are so brilliant because um, they were good and they picked the snare drum. Uh, the marching snare and I was just like oh my god they want to be like me it's my it's all about me and no 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 they pulled that sucker out I started playing it for them and they were like yeah yeah whatever and then they grabbed my sticks 
two of them dove into the band, uh, uh, the, the chairs that were still in the band room and they like hid behind him. And then the kid was just like <laughs> playing it because we just learned how to play uh, diddles. So he was just like, bah, 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 and using it as like a toy gun. <laughs> and the other kids were like diving. And I was like, I mean, it's very imaginative, <laughs> creative. I thought it was all about me for a second there. It is about the love, the sound of it. I mean, you talk about sound. Um, Jojo Mayer, one of my favorite all-time drummers, uh, has a, a video out explaining his, his technique. And he has a... Uh, uh, a part of the video where he's like, let's take a step back and think about the sound that we're trying to get. Now, we all have all these, there's books and, and so much media about how to get the right sound. And then he throws a garbage can down the stairs. And he's like, you know what that sounded like? That sounded like a garbage can getting thrown down the stairs. What if I want that as my sound? Who cares? Maybe that's what I want. <laughs> and I think that's so that's so beautiful like it, uh, for your sound I'm sure it's not like what everybody says it's supposed to sound like right but it's beautiful because it's yours and it tells your story through a beautiful unique sound that no one else could probably recreate and uh, there's something beautiful about that that without dystonia I don't think we'd have like a lens into to see yeah definitely I, I feel like you know when, when I hear people who have dystonia and even if they're able to play just like, you know, one one note or one thing, just like a little two measure thing for even like half a second, I kid you not, even half a second, I know how much strength they have. I'm like, wow, yeah. I have more respect for you than I do for any professional level yep. musician. Yes. Like a thousand, you know? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There's beautiful moments like that that are unique to the dystonia tribe. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think it's important to spread that message as well, because it's like, you know, a, a lot of musicians, um, like you said, we get stuck kind of in that mindset of, you know, I should be better and I should be better than this. And I should be able to easily What's better? overcome this. What does but, that mean? What are you yeah. talking about? What, yeah. is, what do you mean better? You're playing. That's incredible. <laughs> like... Yes. Yeah. With this disorder, it's like miraculous. <laughs> Yeah, like, yeah, it's take, take a step back, like, appreciate what you have. Like, there's, it could have, the dystonia sucks. I'm not minimizing it, but like, there's worse things, and you should express like how frustrated you are, but like, just make sure there's a yang to that yang. Like, make sure you're, you're equally as grateful, as frustrated as you are. That's what I would always tell people is like, don't, this isn't like screw your emotions and and forget about it. like you should be grateful. No, no, no. It, it, it's just that as ugly and uh, frustrating and you know torturous as this could all be, like there's some beautiful moments that you get access to through this that nobody on the planet could even like conceive of. I thought I have a project now where I'm uh, trying to build something a little bit more broader scope. Uh, Obviously, musicians with dystonia, uh, we'd be more than welcome to uh, uh, bring on board. Uh, but it's like I have a friend here that has uh, uh, problems with his neck. So it's he was born with them. And when I talk about my story, it's a lot of sobbing and like, you know, these terrible like uh, black mirror uh, psychological like loop de loops. It's so insane. And his are just like. You know, I was born like this, so this is normal to me. And, you know, you see us both on the street and his neck is kind of stuck like that. And uh, you see me and I'm I'm I look fine. But like we've been through very different experiences. And I I just think that's so interesting that, you know, I get to in the great loss that it was to kind of lose something that I was so passionate about. Like there's so much good and unique uh, little tidbits that came out of it that I'm really grateful for too. Yeah. I think that's so wonderfully said because it's like, you know, as musicians, we kind of, uh, you know, we have our own little sphere, our world that we live in and the story really helps us Very to, small over over kind of outcome overcome that and see kind of parts of the world and, and of ourselves that we 
normally don't see or we don't recognize like uh even certain needs that maybe we've neglected for a long time <laughs> like yeah. oh wow I'm actually good at something else too I didn't realize that um but it, but it is a, is a, definitely a journey it's definitely a journey of, of relearning about oneself and learning about the world around you and and community and and how you want to how you can be a part of that, but, but not have to, you know, necessarily live up to people's standards. You know, you have to recreate your own standards and, and be your own best version of yourself. Um, but I think it's really beautiful, your story and everything that you've said, Jean. And I, I love also, we haven't talked about this yet, but um, I would also love if you shared a little bit about your journey with tango, um, because you did tell me that you got into dance and that helped you a lot with coping with your generalized dystonia. Yeah, so um, I'm not in Buenos Aires uh, by accident. <laughs> I mean, kind of, but um, it was, I was, uh, yeah. So after we found out there's no tumor, it's a generalized dystonia. Um, I realized um, I took their their last medication, which I think was clonazepin. Is that how you say that? Um, yeah, I think so. And <laughs> I took it on a Friday night, woke up on Sunday, and I was like, nope, <laughs> that is insane. Why would you give me? And it was a, a quarter of what they wanted to work up to. <laughs> I was like, so you guys have nothing is what I felt like, right? Like, it felt like they just hit me over the head with a hammer and they were like, good luck with that. Like, that's our best guess. <laughs> I was like, you didn't cure me just because I slept through it. Like, that doesn't count. <laughs> like, I was so frustrated. <laughs> um, so yeah, I didn't take that again because that was mortifying. Um, I'm sure like you got to give everything the benefit of the doubt. Maybe it works for some people. For me, I just hated that loss of control since. Um, and it just didn't seem like it was doing anything. And then the other medications before that, I forget what they were called, but it just made me so nauseous that it was like, thanks for curing my dystonia, but now I'm in the bathroom all day. <laughs> I can't stomach anything. I don't think this works either. <laughs> so um all this to say, like all of the traditional stuff, like I think I've tried everything and it just, it, it was maybe I was minimizing my symptoms, but I was just like, whatever you guys are trying over here, I appreciate it. Keep going. But like, it's not for me. I, I tried it. Thank you. I'm going to try uh, something else. And I think, you know, that whole uh, process of like thinking I had the tumor uh, brought me this new sense of like, um, life is really short <laughs> and we should make sure we are doing what we want to be while we're, while we got it, no matter what you're up against. So I think from there, I was living this, you know, great, I had a great career in technology and I was really grateful for it. But um, the whole reason I did in the first place was like, I should be able to do this from anywhere. And why am I still here behind a desk in a cubicle? I, I could literally do this at home or across the globe in Argentina or whatever. So now I was like, all right, so they're out of ideas, these neurologist guys. Um, <clears throat> and I feel like my symptoms are progressing worse and worse and worse. And nobody can tell me why, what am I going to do? Let's say if I've got one year left of movement, because again, mine's past just drumming. Now I'm like getting stuck in cars and like, <laughs> having little limps and crump walks. So now I'm like, what am I going to do if I can't walk normal after this year? Like, what do I want that year to look like? What? Because if I am stuck, God forbid, in bed somewhere forever, what do I want to remember about what I did the last year of movement? So I'm like, probably not sit in a cubicle, not that, something else. I think I want to just dance the whole time. At this point, one of my things was like, if I can't drum, what could I do with all this rhythm and music that I have? And my answer was like, well, I could dance and don't get me started on dance because that's a whole nother interview. But um, uh, suffice to say, like it just takes the independence that comes with drums and multiplies it by every part of your body. <laughs> so um, if you're a drummer out there and you're curious about uh, how do I use my skills with outside of drumsticks? Uh, dance would recommend. Uh, if you think you're a good drummer, try to dance and you will question everything. <laughs> um, 
So anyway, I started, uh, I started down here in Buenos Aires actually thinking, you know, I'm probably going to have like six months of movement before like whatever this is starts, you know, making it impossible to dance with my thought. So I'm not going to work. I'm not going to do anything. I had the savings. I was ready to go and just dance my little heart out. Buenos Aires is the perfect place for it because it, in other parts of the world, you might be able to go out to dance tango once or twice a month in Buenos Aires and any, there's probably three milongas or three places to dance tango at any given time, day or night. You just go out there and it's just nonstop. And that's what I did. I would just dance. I would probably start at like two or three in the morning and then you dance all night and then you take a little nap at like six or seven the next morning and then you'd wake up at like three and have whatever meal that would be and then you know hang out with your friends and then go out and do it again like it was just this non-stop dancing and I loved it I was so and I would just let I gave myself permission to just like dive in and just enjoy it we don't know after six months we're gonna move again so like let's just you know, it just gave you so much courage. <laughs> so I wouldn't say like I'm a brave person at all, but like dystonia can light some fires under you. Um, and I would encourage people to let that happen because uh, you'll never know what you're going to get from it. What I got from it was uh, eventually zero symptoms. So I, I landed in Buenos Aires with a little bit of a twitchy twitch and a little bit of a limp. And by the end of it, I was telling a friend that I'd met here after like, I think it was six or seven months and I was telling him yeah I have this neurological disorder and he was like no offense but I don't see what you're talking about and I was like yeah it's it's in my and I couldn't even show him I couldn't even replicate it I couldn't even like back then that was in 20 27 20, 2018 2018 and here so I I I couldn't I couldn't show him I didn't have anything to show him and he's like wouldn't you know my first uh my first dance partner has since become a neurologist and in Buenos Aires apparently all you have to do is take them out to get a beer and they'll give you like a an appointment and so I took her out for a beer and um she listened to my whole story and she was like so wait how many hours a day would you say you're dancing tango and I was like dude uh whenever I'm awake if I'm not eating I would say how many hours is that <laughs> and she was like yeah um that would do it we use tango to treat Parkinson's all the time and I was like so you know about this and she's like oh yeah it's like a known thing dance is really good for in neurological disorders because it takes the part of your brain that is typically controlling all these different motor movements and kind of putting it through the ringer, like giving it all these new ways to move. And, and I, I think what I've learned then and since is that dystonia, like if you're the musician that's in the practice room, that's just like zero, like no, uh, no other, you're, you're so dead focused on whatever it is you're trying to uh, fix. And that is the quite opposite approach that you need to be taking. You need to be kind of like understanding, take a step back uh, and understand what this disorder actually is and what it means to your brain uh, because your brain is kind of over it and is trying to tell you, please get away from this part of your brain. I can't do it anymore. It's literally what it's telling you. Um, it's throwing up that 401 page in the website. Just like, I can't figure it out. Like this is too much, the server is down. Why do you keep asking me for the same information? This is all I got for you. <laughs> and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's trying to communicate to you that, and it's the only way it knows how that like, I've got nothing left to try another part of your brain. Try, try, try this part, try that part. And dance is so great for your brain because every single part of your brain has to be online to figure it out. Like there's a, the social con uh, construct of it. You have to like interact with people usually, especially in tango. Um, there's the musicality. Um, you wouldn't imagine, like, I think the most musical people I know are dancers more than musicians. And that probably doesn't make sense to other musicians. I'm not trying to offend them. But dancers are crazy musical. And they're using, like, I never, when I play drums, had to worry about what my toes are doing 
while my right hand is doing the hardest thing I ever had it do before. But like exercises like that, when you even think about it like that, are super good for your brain to be like, oh, there are other movements. There is this, there is that. And I'm not saying it's a cure because I still wouldn't pick up a drumstick tomorrow, but I, I would say it's a, uh, a much healthier way to uh, slow down the progressiveness that is dystonia. I 100% agree there. I think it's it's really important to to move your body in different ways when you have dystonia as well. Uh, one of, and, and it's kind of like a light bulb moment too. Like I kind of like you, I, I had a light bulb moment once where I was like, wow, you know, I, I realized even when I, but I didn't have dystonia, like I didn't really move my body a whole lot, like outside the primary movement that I did while playing my horn. It's like, I was stuck in this position, you know, day after day, you know, year after year, month after month. Um, yeah. I was like, I didn't even like, you know, move this way or that way. I didn't even like go down or up. I just kind of was stuck this way. Um, and so it's such an interesting thing to realize where you're like, wow, you know, our, our bodies weren't meant to be stuck in one position, you know, its whole life and, and move one specific way its whole life. It's kind of ab not, uh, not natural. Um, but I think the more you can break free of that and, and uh, it's, it reminds yourself and your brain and your body, like, wow, uh, I haven't been doing, I haven't been really serving my body to its full yeah. purpose or extent that it should be that's a, used. Yeah, that's a great way to put it is you've got more than just your instrument is kind of the biggest takeaway uh, to dystonia, I think, is like it teaches you not only is there a bigger world outside of your instrument, you have a bigger brain than just the part that plays your instrument. And it is being neglected every time you play your instrument. And I think dance is like, you know, the quintessential like rip off the bandaid and see the world through your, you know, movement uh, is a great way to understand the capacity of which you have to move. I mean, if if I'm if I learned anything from dystonia, it's like celebrate the movement you have, and dance is the best way to do it. And and what I can see, and there's so many like not liking there how many people do you know don't like music like there's always somebody that you you everybody likes some sort of music and dance is great because you could dance to any kind of music you want and a lot of my drummer friends are like oh i don't dance and it's okay fine but um this girl has a better clave than you <laughs> she's never picked up a stick before so like i don't know how to call you a drummer and i don't know what to call her because her groove's better and i don't know how to justify those two things um because in my mind uh like the like it's just gotten so fuzzy between like what is a musician versus what is a dancer to me like i've done so much of both that the the dancers I've I've seen the rhythms that they're doing with their feet with their bodies the independence they have across every from their fingertips to their head to their eyes they're acting while they're doing it I I don't even know you have to know how to do your hair and makeup I never worried about that before in drum corps I just throw on a helmet and go <laughs> all these new things that I'm learning and it's uh it's I'm not going to say it's been great, but it's been, <laughs> it's been a journey. And um, I would just encourage anybody out there to, like you say, stay very curious, stay very open. Um, you know, don't lose hope. Like, I'm not saying there's not a cure to dystonia. I hope nobody takes that away from this, but I'm saying like, in the meantime, um, get outside of that practice room. Cause you're not, it's not in there. Um, I, I would take a few deep breaths and, and start the other side of the journey, which is like that harder, more uncomfortable side of the psychological icky side. And we'll, we're here for you. Like we've been through it. Um, Katie's been awesome uh, as far as like a community support system. Like she's, she's great. Follow her. She's got resources uh, coming out of her ears and we're here for you. Oh, thank you, G. Thank you so much for saying that. And I really am a huge fan of you as well. Uh, and, and I feel like the way you express things is really important because it it, it it speaks to people in, in at many different levels and people who have dystonia of very various forms to kind of understand, you know, the process or the journey of what kind of we go through. So I think it's very important that you shared your story with us here. 
Um, we only have a couple minutes left here and I don't mind if we go over. Um, uh, but I did want to get to a little bit of talking about the app you wanted, you wanted to share about. And um, I am going to post the links to the app she's talking about, as well as the survey that's linked to that as well in the comment section. So I'll go ahead and do that while she's describing it here to you. Um, so if you just want to share a little bit about your project that you're working on, Jean. Yeah, personal plugs. Woo. Um, <laughs> no, so to be clear, there's no app yet. Um, I am a app designer that firmly believes in doing the research necessary to understand exactly what folks need. Um, the app idea is going to be um, similar to what we've been talking about here as far as sharing tools and resources that worked, uh, similar to the idea of capturing those magical moments and like kind of sharing them uh, with the broader community. Uh, you know, maybe it doesn't make sense to the broader public that, you know, maybe a trumpet player can finally squeak out a note. Um, but us dystonia fighters, like we want to celebrate that with you, right? So like giving us our own space, our own app that encourages us to kind of work towards positivity, um, uh, a bank where you can find all the latest resources uh, that the community can kind of share in. Um, that's where we're going to get to. I don't know exactly what it looks like, but I'm hoping the broader community can kind of help me shape what that could look like. Um, and in the meantime, while we're figuring that out and creating some blueprints and starting that project, I hope to kind of uh, work with Katie and the uh, whoever's willing to kind of cultivate um, our little Dystonia tribes across the world and uh, get us all at least in unison here so that we can all work together, understanding and respecting everybody's separate journeys and ways of which they found works for them. Um, and hopefully uh, at the end of the day, we've got like a cool new app that we can all kind of sign into and uh, uh, work towards you know, whatever our journey is and do it together and kind of get high fives along the way. That's kind of what I'm I'm hoping for. Not to be all kumbaya, but um, you know, that's that's how Facebook started, right? I think somebody just wanted a friend and <laughs> and I think uh my idea is to create what's uniquely ours onto a more digitized platform. Um, because we're so spread out again that when I was that scared 20 something year old in the practice room at Disney, not having a clue what I was dealing with, it would have been really nice <laughs> if somebody could have like taken my hand and been like, this is going to be rough and hard, but like, we're with you. And here's some things you can try. Uh, that would have meant everything. So I'm trying to like kind of cultivate that. Um, and selfishly, I would love a friend. Uh, so I, I'm hoping you guys could uh, join up and just if you're if you have interest, if you have ideas, um, we want to hear them. We want to know your story. We want to know about you. Um, Katie's awesome. Uh, she's got some stuff that she's working on, too. So we're going to kind of hopefully work together with those synergies. Uh, not to use all those bad words, but like, I, I, I like what's happening here. And I, I want as many people who are interested and positive and willing to be open and curious uh, to join up. Um, so the form is there and you can do that. You could kind of check out um, the processes that we're going to be using and the different ways that you can uh, uh, help out are right there. Um, but yeah, it's going to kind of start as a community that'll hopefully evolve into an app. Perfect. Um, I've shared the links in the comment section um, as well as or both links that, that Jean sent me. Um, you guys can see that I pinned the comment now. And uh, Sergio, thank you for sending the video. Um, he posted it in one of my groups, so I'll go ahead and forward it to you, Jean. Um, okay. And thank you for sh sharing that, Sergio. Thank you for sharing your video as well. Thanks, Sergio. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. And then... Uh, there's one other thing on here I was going to ask about. Let's see here. No, thank you. I just saw a couple of people tune in that I recognized in the past and I didn't get to say hello, but hello to you guys. Thank you for watching as well. Um, and Jean, just thank you so much for sharing your journey as well. I know I'm kind of repeating myself here, but I, I can't tell you how excited I was to interview you and like how excited I am to hear your story as well in person. Um, and I also, uh, kind of for those who stayed on till the end, um, I'm also very excited to work with you on the association that I'm establishing 
and hopefully we can get your your project as well roped into that as well if you want. Um, otherwise, we'll go ahead and I'll end the session here, the live stream, and we'll maybe we can do this again sometime as well. Maybe we can host like a musicians Estonia chat or something so others can join as well in like one of the Heck groups. Yeah. All right, I'll be down. Thanks so much for having me, Katie. You're welcome. Thank <laughs> you.